Well, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Um, we have an Arctic talk, and you've braved Arctic conditions to get here. So I, uh, I congratulate you, and it's great to have this turnout uh, uh, with the kinds of weather we have here today. Um, I'm Ross Virginia. I direct the Institute of Arctic Studies here at Dartmouth, which is part of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And it's a real pleasure to have a, a, a colleague and a friend from Greenland here, um, Tova Sandel Pedersen. She's here on behalf of the University of the Arctic. She's a member of the Board of Governors. And this group has been meeting here at Dartmouth for the last three days. And uh, UArctic is a, a virtual university. It represents uh, 120 different uh, universities and research centers scattered about the entire circumpolar north. And the goals of UArctic are to uh, enhance education, research, and communication throughout the circumpolar north. And I should acknowledge also another member of the board and the chairman of the Board of Governors, uh, Barry Shearer um, from Dartmouth College. So um, Dartmouth has been part of UArctic from the beginning, and, and it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, have our good friends here from UArctic. Um, uh, Tova has had a, a, a very distinguished uh, record of service to, to Greenland and Greenland, Denmark. Um, she's head of the uh, Greenlandic representation in Copenhagen. Um, and which is really a diplomatic office which represents Greenland's interests in Denmark. And they have a lot of different functions. One very important one is actually to be a public interface, um, to exchange information about Greenland's interests to people in Europe, and um, also to represent uh, Greenlandic students who are studying in, in Denmark, and a whole host of other um, uh, of interests. So she is, it's very similar to an embassy office. They have many of those same functions, and she's, she's heading that operation. Um, she's also uh, been active with the University of the Arctic, and prior to that, she was on the board for, and chair of the board for the University of Greenland, Ili Martu Sufi. Um, those of our students here that go to Greenland are graciously hosted by faculty there, and we, we have a strong uh, relationship with the University of Greenland. So um, that's a very special part of, of what we do when we go there. Um, so she's, she's long been active then in educational issues. Um, she, her training is in uh, literature, English language and literature, and then her graduate work is in social and political sciences. And, as a, and you can see that leading her into her interest in, in, in politics and in government issues. Um, she's, prior to that, she was um, um, the executive secretary for the Indigenous Peoples Secretariat, which is part of the Arctic Council. And she's also represented Greenland on indigenous issues in the Euro e European uh, Commission. So she, again, she's had a long history of interacting and representing Greenland's interests at multiple levels. And so it's a real opportunity, and, and, and we're very pleased to have her here today to talk about some really dynamic and rapid changes that are happening in Greenland. Um, this whole middle row here, many of the, the grad students here are part of our IGERT program. And we spend approximately five weeks in Greenland, and we spend two weeks in Nuuk, the capital, trying to understand the issues around science and rapid change in Greenland and how the people of Greenland are, are thinking about their future and managing their resources. And when we were there this past summer, the big issue that we got engaged in was a very large mining development project. And the questions around how to develop, how fast, who benefits, and then who are the international partners. All that was playing out in front of us, and I, I know coming in from the outside, it was exciting and challenging and, and, and worrying in some dimensions at the same time because the, the, the stakes are very high for Greenland in trying to, to get this right and achieve their national aspirations as, as they examine their resources into the future. So we have an opportunity here to, to talk about resource development in Greenland, and I think the title had something to do about uh, can Greenland escape the resource curse? And I'm sure there's a question mark there. So please join me in a very warm welcome for Tova. Thank you very much, Rush. And also thanks to uh, Barry Shea for as the chairman of the Board of Governors for UArctic. Can you hear me when I stand like this? Uh, for facilitating uh, this opportunity for me to uh, address a small audience uh, on Greenland issues here in uh, here at Hanover at Dartmouth College. Uh, the, the simple idea behind me standing here today was, I mean, uh, well, I mean, while as I traveled this far, I might as well make myself useful to the people 
who are there uh, to learn a little bo uh, a bit more about Greenland and also to you know, discuss, engage with you on, on some of the most uh, important uh, issues that, uh, we, that are being debated currently in Greenland. Uh, a little more about my background. Uh, I, I am a Greenlandic, Kalali uh, Unga, and uh, I am from the very south of Greenland. Uh, my, uh, my mother's family comes from a family uh, who have actually done uh, animal husbandry and small, I mean, a little bit of uh, vegetable gardening for 300 years or so, or 250 years or so. Uh, so, so I have this, my background is growing up in a, in, in the south where both this sort of uh, uh, husbandry, horticultural uh, culture combined with the hunting culture uh, in, in South Greenland. It's uh, hunting uh, for seals has always been very important and also during the summer where it's uh, where the pack ice more or less packs up the southern uh, most shores of, uh, of Greenland. Uh, and then I went to, uh, uh, actually my very first year away from home uh, was when I was 17, uh, where I was uh, an exchange student and uh, uh, with something called the American Field Service, and where I went to Escondido, California. So uh, that was, I mean, for me that was uh, quite a, well, imagine, I mean, when we were growing up, uh, oranges was only something that we saw when they came in with the Christmas uh, ship. Uh, and then suddenly you could just walk out in the garden and pick them from the trees. I mean, it was quite uh, overwhelming um, and very exciting. And so suddenly see the scenery that you only seen on on uh, uh, the movies that we saw, the Western movies we saw in the, in the local community house. Uh, so it was, it was very exotic, but uh, it was also for me a very good uh, immersion into sort of international uh, understanding and, and also understanding uh, Americans. And, uh, and, and still this day I, I have very close uh, ties and contacts with my uh, American host family. Um, but that was a bit about myself. Um, today, as you can understand, I'm, I'm post, I am posted I'm in, in Copenhagen, where, as Russ said, I'm heading the, the, the Greenland government's uh, official representation in Denmark. Um, I was going I'm going to show you, start off by showing you a very touristy, uh, mo uh, touristy film, just for those of you who haven't been to Greenland, so you get a sense of the landscape. And those of you who've been there, I'm sure that the colleagues who works on, uh, uh, in the field of tourism would like to, at some point, would appreciate if you have any sort of feedback on, on the video, uh, whether this is an, a sort of uh, good way, uh, uh, good way of uh, trying to also attract more tourists. So let's start off with this. Just this will last about five minutes. They go so
I'm going to talk about the, the Greenland nation building, Inuit nation building, uh, where I ask the question whether Greenland can escape the resource curse. Uh, to start with, uh, then of course one could ask, uh, why has this question suddenly become uh, relevant? Uh, and, uh, and, and there are three things there where I would like, that I would like to point to. Um, one is that, the, that Greenland simply need to expand its resource base. As it is today, uh, Greenland's uh, 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 cross-national uh, cross uh, product is way lower than uh, what, what, what we find in the USA and in, and in Denmark. Plus, we are, the Greenland government is very much dependent uh, on an annu annual block grant from Denmark of about uh, 360,000 US dollars, um, and which makes up then uh, about uh, somewhere between uh, 50 and 55 percent of the Greenland government's expenditure. On top of that, then uh, we have an aging population. It's really positive that uh, our that our yeah that the elder uh, people are, are you know actually getting uh, becoming healthier and have living longer. But it also means that uh, that we have I mean we have to somehow. Uh, ensure their pensions. And then our only real income base, as it is, is actually um, fisheries. And uh, as you all know, um, being dependent on, on, on fisheries is also somewhat uh, uh, tricky because you always have to, uh, 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 well, it's, First, the market uh, prices fluctuate, and secondly, uh, you also have to uh, to uh, regularize the take that you uh, that you have of those resources, so you, that you are, you ensure sustainability. Uh, and then we also another problem, which also uh, is that uh, we are a very small population, fifty six thousand. 450,000 people scattered in an enormous uh, area, something like um, uh, 80, around 80 settled areas where there is no infrastructure in between them. And so just imagine the, the cost of social uh, delivery services for such a, a scattered population. Uh, so we simply, we, we do need to expand uh, our resource base. Um, just here, you can see, I mean, our export, how much we rely on, on the fisheries and whereof the shrimps are the most important. Um, the other thing is also that the, the second thing that I want to point to is as part of our aspiration for, for self-determination as a, as a nation, as a people, uh, the Greenland Inuit, we uh, expanded the, the autonomy agreement that we had uh, from 1979, which, what, uh, which we call, was called Home Rule, into something that was called uh, self-government in, uh, in 2009. And what self-government uh, meant, uh, the most important thing is that the, that the act uh, of self-government um, affirmed that the people of Greenland have the right of self-determination in accordance with international law. And as a consequence, there was also in that act, there is a, a sort of like a schedule for uh, in the event, in an eventual future, if Greenland wants to uh, pursue independence, then there is a schedule for how that should be conducted. Uh, uh, and where it says, you know, there has to be a referendum, etc. And uh, And secondly, uh, 
what this law, uh, what this uh, act on self-government also meant was a new uh, economic arrangement between Denmark and Greenland. Uh, bottom line here is that the annual grants that we receive so far um, will would be sort of frozen. And in the event that we want to take over more competence areas, then we, the Greenland government, ha uh, have, uh, has to finance those new areas ourselves. So there is this uh, you know, incentive for us if we want to uh, become more uh, economically self-reliant uh, to actually develop our economy. Thirdly, then, I mean, uh, then this law also uh, give Greenland the de facto ownership and control of all um, resources, non-living resources, carbon, carbon and mineral resources. Uh, the fact is that uh, Greenland has uh, basically always maintained its, uh, its control of its living resources. Uh, uh, but w while the mineral uh, and carbon resources always was a sort of, uh, since at least uh, uh, 1979 was something that was co-managed between uh, the Danish state and, and the Greenland uh, government. <coughs> and then the third factor, uh, why this becomes relevant is that, uh, that Greenland is extremely rich in mineral resources. Uh, here, yeah, it's, I mean, here you, on this map, you only see the, the most advanced projects, and you probably all, heard, whoops, what happened? And you probably only heard, uh, what you heard most about is this iron ore mine uh, close to Nuuk. Uh, and then uh, you probably also heard about the, some of the rare earth element uh, deposits in the very south of Greenland. Uh, and, and these uh, sites are actually the projects which are sort of where we know uh, that has been examined the closest and where we should be able to take off uh, in, in a few years' time. And then on top of the minerals, and we also have a lot of, uh, I mean, carbon resources, mostly offshore of the west uh, coast, and also of the of the northeast coast. I think uh, the U.S. Geological Survey has actually made an estimate of uh, of uh, what potentials lie off the shores of the Greenland coasts. And, and I think it's uh, one of the largest un, uh, unexplored uh, carbon uh, resources in the Arctic region. So that, that is, I mean, this is uh, the background for why uh, this question of uh, whether the resource course, uh, curse can be, uh, can be, uh, why this question of whether Greenland can escape the resource curse uh, needs to be, be asked. Uh, and that is, I mean, to repeat it, uh, we simply need to exp uh, expand our economic uh, base. Uh, we also do it, we also uh, lean on other, of course we'll continue also to uh, pursue a strategy of sustainable fisheries and we also try to expand our tourism. Uh, and then we also try to uh, develop a leaner administration, a, a leaner public administration and, and, and infrastructure. But we are, I mean, we, re we really need the potential that lies in the, in the mineral uh, sector. And then let me just, uh, let me just, uh, define or, or remind ourselves what is usually thought of when we think of the resource curse. 
First, uh, we usually, it's usually tied with the fact that the economy goes more or less bankrupt. Uh, in some countries, it's, uh, it was co it's called uh, the Dutch disease because uh, uh, in Netherlands, after they discovered the gas in the, in the North uh, Sea, then suddenly this uh, gas uh, industry created an enormous uh, inflation and which actually killed all other uh, sectors and businesses of, of the Dutch economy. Um, and then there is also an issue related to the volatility of, of revenues from, from the raw materials that you sell. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, as you all know, all pri oil prices, oil and gas prices goes up and down, gold, mineral prices, I mean, you, are, you cannot control those, uh, uh, those prices uh, uh, and how the world market prices develop. Um, and the third thing is uh, simple government mismanagement, uh, corruption, uh, that a corrupt elite takes control and uh, put all the revenue in their own pockets and uh, at the expense of the welfare of the broader population. Oh, was that all I had to say? <laughs> uh, certainly what, what we are very aware of, what Greenland is very aware of is that, uh, that we certainly have to, uh, we we really have to make all sorts of, um, sec uh, make ourselves, um, uh, what is it called? Yeah, we, we have to av avoid the resource curse. Uh, of course, I mean, we are, not the, we are not any perfect than any other people in the rest of the world. Uh, and we cannot solve a lot of the problems that, the, that they haven't been able to solve in, in, in the rest of the world. Uh, but what we can do is that we can at least try to harness ourselves, uh, our legislation, uh, in a way where we can at least mitigate most of these uh, dangers. Uh, when it comes to... Um, uh, ma making sure that we are not killing uh, other sectors of economy and uh, then uh, and avoiding inflation, then we have to remember one thing is that uh, we have um, this economic arrangement that we have, new economic arrangement that we have with Denmark, is that for all revenues that comes from the mineral, oil and gas sector, then the first uh, one, uh, what, how much? Uh, 75 million Danish kroner in revenue that we get per year will go to our own purse, to the Greenland purse. But what is above that in revenue per year is split in two parts, and where then uh, one part goes towards compensating the annual block grant that we are already receiving from Denmark. So, so there is no, no likelihood of any fast uh, gain or revenue uh, for, for many years still. Um, secondly, what we have also done immediately after the introduction of, uh, of self-government, uh, we established by law uh, um, a resource fund uh, I don't know whether any of you have heard about the, the Norwegian oil fund. Actually, it's, uh, it's, we more or less emulated the, the Norwegian oil fund so that we will be able to, when that day comes, and hopefully when that day comes, that we can d divert as much of the revenue into this resource fund. So it doesn't, uh, yeah, go in and so heat up uh, the Greenland economy or, or raise the expectation too much in the general population that we can just uh, spend the money just because we have them, but that we should rather uh, save them for for poorer times and and for the future. 
The second thing about the volat uh, vol uh, volatility on, uh, uh, of revenues is that the, uh, the now uh, dissenting government, uh, we just had elections, general elections to our parliament uh, last week, the now dissenting parliament uh, government has uh, established a policy where the revenues from uh, uh, activities in, in, in this sector will come from, uh, from tax, uh, income tax, uh, the uh, revenue tax from the companies and uh, income tax to all those employed in, in the sector. Uh, and then less on, on the production uh, value of whatever raw materials is taken out. Uh, so this way it's, uh, I mean, we become less dependent on, well, to some degree less dependent on, on the volatility of revenues. Um, but of course, um, one of the dangers of having, uh, of having uh, established this form of, uh, um, of taxation of the revenues of, of companies is many of these companies will be multinational companies, and uh, and you he all heard about the the issues related to transfer pricing. I mean, if they have a big revenue in one country, then they just move it uh, to uh, another chapter in another country. Uh, and of course, I mean, if people, if companies really want to cheat, there is no way uh, that 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 we can uh, be completely uh, yeah sure that they will not cheat us but at least what we have is that we have these uh, uh, cooperation and agreements on uh, on tax evasion with several of these uh, uh, together with many as uh, all the nordic countries we have these uh, agreements with uh, on information exchange of inf information of many of the so-called tax haven uh, countries and so we have uh, our uh, the remedies that we have for actually avoiding uh, or at least preventing tax evasion from some of the con uh, some of the companies have uh, are, are actually getting stronger or there are more of them um, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. So the volatility is prevented by taxing the companies, and then what are you doing with the revenue that the taxes produce? Or where, is the, where do the taxes go? The taxes go to the government. But there are, of course, there are clearly, I mean, the taxes that come directly from that industry will, of course, be calculated as revenues from uh, from the the area so there will be as I explained before there will be split in two parts so where one part will be uh, go to the Danish government so as a compensation so that they don't I mean for the block uh, grant that they're paying and the other will go to the Greenland government directly but where most of it will be, then put into our resource uh, fund. Yeah. Government mismanagement. Um, it should be, Greenland is being so small, Greenland is a very transparent country. Um, it's easy to see when uh, your neighbors uh, go, uh, goes and buy a big uh, yard and then you can, it's easy to tell, well, I mean, uh, where did he get that kind of money from? So, uh, so that is one thing. But another thing is also that uh, we have more or less, uh, we have a very strong democracy, uh, democracy based on, um, on pa uh, parliamentarian uh, democracy and uh, a strong uh, rule of law. We have actually taken over, not completely, uh, sort of copied uh, Danish legislation, but many of the of the principles of, of uh, Western uh, Nordic Danish uh, 
uh, administration uh, is actually something that uh, is that we have naturalized into Greenlandic sort of uh, legislation. Uh, so certainly, I mean, uh, so you don't have the same dangers as you see in, you know, uh, in countries, developing countries with, uh, that have problems with, uh, with governance. You don't see the same problems uh, in Greenland. Uh, but of course, I mean, no one is corruptible. Even the best ones uh, can are corruptible, and this is why we have a strong interest in having as a, a strong um, civil society, uh, which also you know, that insists on on transparency in uh, transactions and decisions and and proper hearing uh, mechanisms. Um, so, so I, I mean, I am uh, pretty optimistic that uh, that we will uh, be able to uh, to escape many of uh, the curse as such. But of course, I mean, we will not be completely immune to uh, to the dangers and, and the ills that always come with having to uh, exploit such potentially uh, profitable uh, resources. Um, maybe uh, I was going to write Koyanak. Uh, thank you. But I was w maybe we could go to some questions and some debate, and I would also like to, I mean, I, I will also be glad to talk about the current, uh, uh, the expected uh, shift in government uh, following the parliament elections last week, and I'm in your hands. Yeah, so the intent now is just to have a discussion about these issues and changing political landscape in Greenland, which just had elections. Yeah, you know, another possible problem in, in addition to the list you have that was basically economic and political is the social issue, I think, in Greenland, isn't it? Because you have this very small population, 160,000 people. You have all those minerals that need to be exploited, so it's import of expert, experts and workers who could actually have a large effect on the local population in some ways. How is that being dealt with? Um, one of the big uh, debates uh, for the past year has uh, been uh, our law on large-scale industries. The thing is that in order for us to get a lot of these projects going, uh, there is a need for enormous investment. And we don't have that money. Uh, and so we have to attract companies and, and capital from the outside to do the actual investment in infrastructure and, and build, uh, building the sites before actual uh, exploitation starts. And for instance, this iron ore uh, mine just uh, off Nuuk uh, is a project which is so large that it requires, I think it's about uh, what is the equ equivalent of little more than two billion uh, US dollars. It's not a lot maybe in the USA, but, but it's a lot of money for Greenland. Uh, and it will, in just establishing the infrastructure uh, and the mine, will require an annual workforce of between two and three thousand uh, persons, and we simply don't have that manpower in Greenland. Uh, and so what has been uh, the scenery, what has been foreseen is the importation of, uh, of troops of foreign labor, and what has been mentioned frequently is uh, Chinese labors, uh, laborers, uh, and that's simply because uh, some potential interest in investing has come from some Chinese players. Uh, but actually, just the other day, there was a spokesperson from the Chinese uh, government uh, who at a, 
uh, at a press uh, uh, press interview said that the uh, actually denounced uh, China's uh, eagerness to to go and invest in, in in Greenland. But anyway, but the idea is then to import uh, a contingent of temporary workers, and the way that that will be uh, managed is that most of these sites, and including this iron ore uh, sites, is uh, far away from the town, so there would be they will be uh, kept in camps uh, and, and they will be under con uh, contractual obligation to, to stay away, uh, I mean, to remain within the confines of, of the camp. Uh, and, uh, and so it, sh it, should be, it should be possible to control. But of course, there will also be some Greenlandic workers, uh, two, 3,000 Greenlandic workers, who then, of course, engage with the Chinese laborers, but um, but I think it will be. I mean, the psychological environment will probably be pretty much like the what is going on right now at the um, Thule uh, Air Base, the American Air Base, where you have you know civilian Greenlanders, uh, Greenlandic laborers also sort of within the confines of a camp uh, engaging with workers from uh, the US and, and from, from Denmark, uh, and where they spent uh, day and night uh, for several weeks within the confines of a camp. So that's, that's how it's foreseen it will be managed. Um, Yeah, uh, certainly a lot of the documentation uh, that is related uh, is is in English, uh, and and so that represents a barrier for the sort of more or uh, broader audience in 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 Greenland because most Greenland the majority part of Greenlanders I mean they Greenlandic is their mother tongue. Um, they might know some Danish, but definitely it's only a minority who, who actually ha speaks and reads English well enough to actually understand these materials. But this is also where it's very important to rely on a strong civil society, which actually can sort of uh, uh, translate and, and broker that, uh, that, uh, that information. Uh, in a way so the general audience will understand it. Um, but of course, langu language is an issue and it will be an issue. But I guess that's, of course, in, in a country like Greenland, it's, it's an extra you know, sort of barrier. But I mean, how many of you Americans, even though you are well educated, understand a lot of the documentation between in that, I mean, that is underlying the whole <laughs> uranium industry, just to take an example. There's the idea of becoming more um, economically autonomous out, completely outweigh the idea of having, keeping your pure landscape. Um, We have this aspiration of becoming an, yeah, a self-determining independent uh, nation. And, and independence can mean a lot of things. I mean, you can always think of, I mean, it can be independence in a traditional sense where we have our completely independent own state, but it can also still be within the, within the Danish realm, still part of the kingdom, or it can be like uh, uh, in free association with Denmark, uh, like Cook Islands with Australia. I mean, you can foresee a lot of you know, arrangements, uh, but what, what is very important uh, for, for, for us Greenlanders is the sense of 
of actually being able to uh, earn your own money to provide for yourself financially. Uh, because if you cannot provide for yourself financially, then political independence do not really have any meaning uh, if you have to go piggybacking every other day. Uh, so, uh, so that's why it's so important. Plus another incentive, as I also mentioned, for us to, to expand our income base is, I mean, the poverty rates in Greenland are, is very high. Uh, and also the, the inequality in income is very, very high still. And, uh, and, we, need, uh, and we really need to do something about it. Uh, plus our need for investment uh, in the area of education is also enormous. I mean, it's something like only 40, 45% of uh, kids leaving secondary education uh, continue uh, pursuing uh, further education. So we really have to you know, kick those figures up. You know, so at least now we have the ambition that at least 70% of kids leaving secondary education should continue. Yeah, uh, following the last question, do you have the infrastructure and who, who is there to um, write environmental regulations and enforce environmental regulations and oversee these two billion dollar operations. Is, is, is the infrastructure there in the uh, population? Uh, we still don't have the full uh, capacity and the full infrastructure. So this is why we have an agreement with the, with the Danish uh, agency, Danish government agency for environmental uh, protection. Uh, and they're actually the ones who have this, uh, uh, who technically uh, have, this, uh, have this role of being our uh, environmental control agency. But the idea is that with time, we will also build our own uh, capacity. But for a start, then we rely a lot on, uh, we rely on this Danish agency. There's a, an apparent tension between, between the need to, uh, for the national sovereignty purposes and the development purposes to develop the extensive amount of uh, energy resources, and of course the, the potential also for accelerating uh, the not only England and Greenland, which affects the both traditional way of life and the spillover effects elsewhere. Uh, has, uh, has anyone uh, started to look at the uh, potential with, with the mineral development projects of putting very strict limitations on soot emissions, black carbon emissions, other things that might essentially affect, you know, might tend to speed up, you know, the, uh, the melting. So if the Chinese or others, uh, you know, were, were to proceed with uh, major energy development projects, they would put very strong pollution controls that would uh, at least ensure you know, a minimum of, uh, of effects uh, uh, the thing about um, on a global scale, even if we suddenly all these mines here uh, uh, start to operate, and they that they and that they are powered by diesel uh, and not by the carbon uh, hydrocarbon uh, hydroelectric resources that we also have, uh, then in a global in a global, in the global picture, our contribution would be yeah, minimal. I mean, um, and so, so the way that we argue, of course, w what we 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 want to have a clean environment, and uh, about already now, uh, seven percent of our energy use. Uh, comes from uh, the exploitation of the of of of, of water, uh, hydroelectric uh, power, uh, and we would very much like to see that that many of those sites are actually also powered by uh, by hydroelectric power. Um, but but we are also arguing. I mean, when speaking to the Western world. Uh, 
uh, and where we actually use the same argument that many developing countries have is that, uh, I mean, you created this problem. Uh, and so now you are asking us to not develop and develop our economy. Uh, so, I, so I think uh, what is important for us is to participate in international cooperation in, uh, together with Denmark to actually do something about the global carbon emissions. Um, because what we, what we do does not really, it's so tiny, does not really make the, a difference. Are you not concerned about, I guess, things like oil spills in far northern regions can have a much larger impact on environmental, especially if you have a traditional lifestyle and, like, for example, eating green mammals and things like that, you can have a lot more direct toxicity to your own traditional way of life. Is that not a concern, I guess? It's an enormous concern. Uh, and this is also why we uh, we are applying uh, the strictest uh, standards uh, for yeah for environmental uh, safety uh, and and there are a lot of things that I mean we are actually uh, leaning a lot about uh, on the expertise of the Norwegians who has. Uh, and we have an agreement with the Norwegian government because they have experience both from the North Sea but also from the Barents Sea of, uh, of uh, offshore uh, exploitation uh, in, in, in cold in Arctic waters. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, we, are, we, we are of course very uh, concerned. But, but I mean, it's, uh, life is never safe, huh? I mean, uh, what, what I mean, I always think of this picture of this very holy, uh, this this very holy Hindu caste in uh, in um, in India. Uh, I mean, they are vegetarians, but they are not even allowed to sort of uh, swallow uh, insects. So they always keep their mouths covered, and they have to be careful not to step on any ants when they walk. Um, I mean, we, I mean we, we have to use the resources that we have and to exploit them uh, sustainably and in, in the safest possible way. Uh, and, and, and the thing is, I mean, um, I think most Greenlanders are extremely passionate about our environment. Also because m even though many of us uh, seem to live a modern life in, in towns, we work in offices, in, in heated buildings, uh, the ability to, to actually use our environment uh, in, our, in, uh, in our spare time is so important for our emotional, spiritual um, health but also for, for, uh, for supplementing our, our food and uh, nu nutritional needs, you know, hunting and fishing, uh, picking berries, uh, using the resources, uh, the, the healthy resources of, of, of that the nature provides us is, is very, very important um, for modern Greenlanders. So. Uh, so yeah, we are concerned, and that's why we will apply the toughest uh, rules and, and, and also technology, best available technology. It's a tough one, but I think it's a it's a, le a legacy of uh, of our colonial past, um, uh, and you know, and the 
many, many, much of it is related to the, the social problems that we have. And there's also a linguistic issue involved. Um, uh, our educational system uh, is very much based on a Danish system, uh, and to a large degree on a on a uh, curriculum that is based on the, on the Danish language. So when you come with a background of uh, with a, a Greenlandic as a mother tongue, then uh, I mean you really have some uh, some barriers to overcome. Um, but but I think it's the situation that we have with education in Greenland is pretty much the same among indigenous peoples all over the world. That that uh, and and I think um, in a very complex way and in in ways that are very difficult to overcome. Uh, uh, those are le le uh, legacies of our colonial pasts. Um, but this is also why it's so extremely important uh, that research is being done in this area. Um, uh, because uh, there, are, there are success stories uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, let's, you know, let's see, I mean, let's have more research that sort of makes us understand what, what it is, uh, uh, I mean, why these examples uh, produce such good results. Actually, we uh, we had a reform. Um, we had a ed education reform, uh, which uh, was la launched in two thousand and two, uh, and that one was very much um, inspired by. Uh, uh, I don't remember what the school uh, is called, but it's uh, at uh, Berkeley University. It's something developed at Berkeley University where they build on the experiences of teaching um, you know, um, American natives uh, and also inner city sort of uh, yeah, disadvantaged kids. Um, but uh, unfortunately, it, it doesn't seem uh, like this reform has quite uh, produced results. Um, but it's also, I mean, in my private opinion, there are, there is also a lot of fads in education. I mean, you have reforms, and then you say, ah, this will work, and and then years down the lane, you discover that uh, it doesn't work. Um, and I think uh, internationally, probably the only ones who have really sort of found a way that works are the are the Finns, and it could be interesting to look more at what it is the Finns are able to do that the rest of the world uh, seem to be struggling with. I just wanted to make a comment about um, the, the question of pollution. And on my, I definitely agree with your statement that the Western world has created much of the, the global greenhouse gas emissions. But I think that that may not be the most important part of the conversation. I think it has more to do with the proximity to the ice sheet. And last summer, 97% of the surface of the Greenland ice sheet melted, and black carbon was the key player in that That um, almost entire ice sheet wide melt event. So the proximity of having black carbon emissions will be really important to preserving, and preserving the ice sheet and not dumping that much fresh water into the, the ocean. Yeah. Definitely, I mean, black carbon is a, is, a, is a concern, and this is also something that, uh, uh, that we are also having, um, that we have to you know, uh, take into account when we make the technical requirements uh, for, for the new industries that will arise. But still, the most, I mean, the majority chunk or part of the 
black carbon actually travels from, from the south. Um, I mean, the local source is minimal. So, uh, so if we, I mean, black, if we have to avoid black carbon, then we actually have to work on it on a global scale. I, I would just argue that the size of the particles coming out of Greenlandic plants would be a much bigger influence. Um, the particles, the size of particles coming from the south, are so much smaller because of the amount of uh, land it has to travel. Uh, I, it'll become a key player in the, the energy balance. Well, it it will also depend on depend on the size of of, of uh, the size of the individual uh, mines, and also what it is they're actually you know mining. Uh, so, um, but it's certainly something that uh, that that we have to be aware of, and uh, and I'm sure that I trust the Danish uh, environment uh, agencies that we also have. Uh, biologists who, who think the, along the same lines as you do. So could, could you talk a little bit about the elections that just happened in Greenland and in particular how the debate around the elections might relate to issues around development or not to develop and what do you see as this new government, uh, how is it going to come together and what positions it might have? I'll be glad to. But then um, I, I have to underline that I'm speaking in my private capacity yeah. uh, because currently, uh, I mean, what we are now in a caretaker government mode where the dissenting government is taking care of government until a new government has been formed. Um, maybe I can get the, I can show the results of the, of the election. Party Inuit is a more or less a protest party. Uh, 
they are very much focusing on the sort of the national values, Inuit values, and their argument is that the last four uh, four years uh, government uh, were focusing too much on economic development uh, that more benefited those who are well to do anyway, and uh, and it was a development that became more and more Danish and less and less Greenlandic. Uh, and, uh, and as an example, normally uh, political campaigns, uh, campaign meetings in Greenland are bilingual, uh, and they refused to take place, uh, to take part in those meetings where Danish was the language. So they are more or less a protest party. Uh, and then, in the party, uh, they were, were in this very broad coalition, the Inuit and Hatsige, and they actually lost uh, one, one seat. And as soon the Conservative Party also lost uh, one seat. Uh, and the issue is that what is really surprising is why did, did, did this coalition led by Inuit and Hatsige uh, lose? My, my theory is, and I know that uh, many of my colleagues agree with me, is that they started the, the expectations uh, that people had to them uh, were very, very high. Uh, and then they had this method of uh, building their policies upon uh, you know, facts, evidence, thorough analysis. Uh, so, uh, so they were not, and, and they had several commissions working, a commission on welfare and tax, a commission on fisheries, a commission on infrastructure, uh, where they had uh, expert commissions where they had experts coming up with, you know, first they work for two years and uh, analyzing the subject uh, area, and then they came up with the recommendations, and then, and then, and only then was this presenting government able to take legislative initiative. And so, so they were perceived as being very technocratic, uh, being too slow, were not able to produce results fast enough, uh, and plus also uh, that they favored uh, Danes more than the Greenlanders. And here the, uh, the explanation is that the, the Greenland government uh, also elected legacy of our colonial past has a number of public, uh, uh, publicly government-owned companies, uh, like our big fisheries export company, World Greenland, uh, our national uh, airline, Air Greenland, uh, the supply uh, companies, electricity companies, uh, all these companies, public works, um, all these companies are they're actually formed as, uh, as corporations. Uh, and their boards, before this dissenting government came into power, when Sjumut was in power, the boards of those companies were politically uh, appointees. Uh, and what the dissenting government did when they came into power was to replace all these political appointees with professionals. People who knew about international marketing, when it, people who knew about uh, fish processing, people who knew about international uh, aviation, you know. And the result was that, yes, they had to draw on a lot of things. And so from a Greenlandic perspective, it, looks, it looked as if they were favoring Danes over Greenlanders. Uh, 
in, in the sort of efforts to professionalize the, the governance of these public uh, companies. So, so I think, uh, that, I mean, that is, that is why I think they lost. And then this partition was very, was very intelligent and very good at sort of capitalizing on, on the, on the, yeah, on the sort of more populistic, nationalistic uh, sort of uh, sentiments and, and the discontent. Uh, and I think that is uh, that is what I mean. So it's 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 a it's a reaction, I think. Where do you see a coalition being formed to uh, to be be able to cover? Where who are they looking to for allies? Uh, there are three three big issues uh, that they're discussing. Uh, that Sherwood has been very much against is this uh, legislation law on large scale industries that I mentioned earlier, where they would like to tighten up some of the paragraphs in, in that act uh, that is related to the conditions of, of the Greenland, Greenland neighbors. Uh, and then there is the issue of uh, lifting the zero tolerance tar of uh, exploitation of radioactive. Uh, raw materials. Uh, in South Greenland, um, we have one of those uh, rare earth element uh, deposits, the one in Gwennosla, uh, Kvanefjell, uh, is actually uranium. Uranium and thorium. And we have an old policy from the 80s saying that we don't want to, uh, that we prohibit the mine, mining of uranium. And so we have as what we call a zero tolerance for radio radioactive uh, raw materials. And CO wants to lift that. I mean, they want to adjust that tolerance level. Um, and these also want to, they, they will agree to, to yeah, adjust the stars level, so will they, they are absolutely against. Um, and they're very, they also have strong ecological uh, concerns. And, what the, and then there was one more thing, oh yeah, uh, how you tax uh, how you tax the foreign companies, uh, the mining companies? Do you do it by just as I said, uh, as, a, uh, as a as a strategy of the descending government by taxing uh, the income and the revenue, uh, or do you do it by royalties by taxing asking a fee of the production of the actual material that they take out? Schumann prefers, I mean, one where the, there's, a, I mean, they call it royalty, where you, you tax or ask a fee for the actual uh, material that you take out. Um, so those are the big issues. But I know the ladies I heard, they are out. Um, and so they have run into a second round of negotiations and the latest that I've heard is that those two are negotiating now uh, on, on the basis of uh, you know, their drafting papers together. Uh, so it's, it's still, I mean, it's still a possibility that uh, that that Sumer and IA would be able to uh, cooperate, and I think uh, most, I mean, the business community in Greenland, uh, actually, in the majority uh, of the people in Greenland, actually recommended recommending in order to ensure stability for the years ahead and 
know, the credibility of women and innovation. Yeah. And they can actually, I mean, they can compromise, uh, they can compromise by just making uh, symbolic changes so, so that she will not lose face. I mean, for instance, when you, when you talk about the, the zero tolerance for, for, for radioactive mining, that tolerance level is, has actually been set quite arbitrary. You can still sort of adjust it a little bit and still not you know, open up for the way you mining. So, so there's, I mean, there's always a lot of compromises that can be struck in, in uh, politics when there is a war. But it's exciting days, I mean, just, uh, I think all of us are checking uh, the news every other half hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of us for this excellent